What is up, DS3 TV? We are back for another video. This one is Julian, the rise of the last pagan emperor of Rome. And uh, yeah, so this should be pretty good. And let's get into it. Also, subscribe to the channel. I want to get down to subscribers by um, my birthday, September 13th. And uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, um, you can put videos in the comment section down below that you want to watch. That you want me to watch. And also, um, what else was I going to say? Uh, this video is by Kings and Generals. And uh, yeah, let's get into it and play. Historians often argue the merits of the great man theory and the theory of trends and forces. These two conflicting theories crossed swords during the fleeting reign of Roman Emperor Julian. As the Roman Empire's Christianization accelerated during the mid to late 4th century, this most extraordinary and unlikely of rulers rose in the shadow of one of Rome's most lethal figures to become Augustus. Welcome to our first video on Julian, his early life, and the Battle of Strasbourg. If you're keen on biographies, the sponsor of today's video Blinkist is a great choice. Blinkist is a unique platform that takes non-fiction books and turns them into 15-minute audios, the Blinks. That means you can learn new things despite being on a tight schedule and not having much time. Blinkist makes learning easy and fun. Flavius Claudius Julianus of the Constantinian dynasty was born to Christian parents, and his father Julius Constantius was Constantine the Great's half-brother. The era of his birth, the early 4th century, was a ruthless age of court intrigue, and Julian's entry into this cutthroat world came in 337 AD, when he was barely six years old. The victor of the Milvian Bridge and the first imperial patron of Christianity, Constantine, was dead. His 19-year-old son, Constantius II, orchestrated the Great Massacre, slaying Constantine's nephews, half-brothers, and their sons. Many other nobles, and even a Praetorian prefect, were killed. Only two members of the family survived, one of whom was Julian, spared either because he wasn't considered an immediate threat, or due to his young age. His father wasn't so lucky. Instead, Julian was sent to Nicomedia, where he was entrusted to the care of a local bishop. Sometime later, Julian was shifted to Maculum, an imperial estate near Caesarea. Under constant vigil and forbidden any companions, except for expressly permitted slaves, Julian found solace in the vast library of the city's bishop, George. Scattered between the Christian texts were older writings of pagan philosophy, religious history and literature, which planted the seed of apostasy in young Julian's mind. Time went on, Julian continued his formal Christian education and was eventually permitted by Constantius to travel further afield. He didn't cause a wink of political trouble for Augustus in Constantinople, but immersed himself in rhetoric, philosophy and learning, which eventually led him to believe, at the age of 20, that following Rome's old gods was the only way to live a good life. Despite being born into the monotheistic faith, Julian was done with it. He also became what by our standards might be seen as a bit of a nerd. <laughs> Just call him. <laughs> you know, out of all out of all things this channel has said, I don't think I imagine them saying that he would that he has turned into a nerd. <laughs> don't gotta insult the man. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, he, he, he was alright. I mean. <laughs> but life was about to take an utterly unexpected turn. And in 355, Julian was invited to the court in Mediolanum. He was probably expecting death, but instead, in his words, some of them, as if they were in a barber's shop, cut off my beard and dressed me in a military cloak and transformed me into a rather laughable soldier. Constantius had been warring against Magnentius for some time, and although the usurper was defeated at Mercer and Mons Seleucus, the civil war allowed the Rhine frontier to collapse completely. A Germanic leader, Chnodomar, then used the imperial chaos to invade and sack Eastern Gaul, which forced Constantius to appoint the unassuming Julian as Caesar, as he was not a military man, and therefore not a potent threat. 
Julian confirmed his status by wedding Constantius's daughter Helena and departed for Gaul in late 355. Once the new Caesar arrived at Julia Vienensis not long after, he immediately burst into a flurry of energetic study of a new kind. With considerable diligence, Julian embraced the art of Roman warfare, whilst studying the strategies, tactics and actions of antiquity's great military leaders. Julian knew he was just an imperial figurehead, while Magister Peditum, Marcellus, held de facto supreme command, but was still eager to do his best. The plan for 356 was clear. While Constantius II invaded enemy territory from Raetia, Julian would close the barbarians' line of withdrawal back across the Rhine. The Caesar marched north from Julia Venensis to Juro Cortorum via Augusto Dunham, evading Germanic raiding bands all the way, and joined the main Gallic army under Marcellus. Assuming direct command of the army, much to the Magister Peditum's distaste, Julian advanced in the direction of the Rhine. However, on a misty day en route to their destination, the two rearmost legions were ambushed by Alemanni barbarians and almost destroyed. After suffering considerable losses, they were only saved by the reinforcing elite units. Bloodied but undeterred, Julian continued onwards in the direction of Brocamagus, crushing another Alemanni force blocking his path to the city with textbook use of a two-pronged pincer tactic. It wasn't a decisive victory, but by this point Constantius's assault from Raetia was underway, and Julian's triumph convinced the Alemanni to sue for peace, which allowed Julian to pivot north towards Cologne, where he conducted refortification efforts and coerced the local Frankish chieftains into a favourable peace. Julian then travelled back to Gaul's interior, dispersing most of his Julian was putting me at work. troops throughout many fortresses to protect them from barbarian raiders, and then entered winter quarters at Agendicum. Although this was a prudent action, the consequential lack of strength allowed Julian to be besieged by a force of glory-seeking Alemanni. Here Julian showed his true colours, standing resolute among his soldiers and launching sorties which, although unsuccessful, garnered immense respect. Either because he believed he was doing Constantius a favour, or because he despised the Caesar's independent command, Marcellus didn't send any aid, a fact which led to his scathing recall to Mediolanum by the Augustus, and his replacement by a new general, Severus. Once he'd seen off the Alemannic siege, Julian zealously recruited additional soldiers into the army, swelling his force to a total of 13,000 soldiers. Soon after, he received his orders for 357 from Constantius. The Emperor was departing to the frontier at Sirmium, leaving General Barbatio with 25,000 troops to function as the right wing of a large-scale Roman pincer operation from Augusta Rauricorum, while Julian was to continue operating in the north, cutting the barbarians' line of retreat and destroying enemy warbands wherever he found them. The conclusion of this plan was a final crossing of this pincer just to the south of Strasbourg. The plan was lethal on paper, but possessed far too many moving parts to actually work. Still, the campaigning season began well enough, with Barbatio gradually advancing northwards and Julian moving to Juricaturum and then east towards the Rhine. Unfortunately, an unforeseen band of Leyte marauders inserted themselves between the two converging forces and attacked Lugdunum, pillaging throughout the area. This forced Julian to detach three squadrons of light cavalry from his main army to smash the raiders. A vast number of Leyte were killed by the onrushing Imperial riders, but some survivors managed to flee Rhinewards. It seems as though these fugitives would be caught by Barbatio's sentries coming the other way, but were apparently allowed to pass by the general's subordinates. The laxity shown by Barbatio was in fact the first act in his spiteful non-cooperation with Julian. Although delayed, the Caesar was approaching from Juricaturum. Passing by an Alemanni blockade of felled trees at the Col de Saverni Pass, he reached the Germans' apparently impregnable haven a series of islets dotting the Rhine River, which they believed ponderous Romans couldn't cross. They were underestimating Julian. 
Approaching the river, Julian asks Barbatio for seven ships to build a pontoon bridge. However, Barbatio instead explicitly elected to burn them all. Forced into a contingency, Julian ordered a contingent of an elite Auxilia Palatina unit, known as the Conuti Signores, to forge the low summertime flow by using their shields as a float. All Alemanni men, women and children inhabiting the nearest of the Rhine islets were quickly butchered by Julian's men in full view of the other islanders, who swiftly vacated them and returned to their side of the Rhine. The Palatina troops gathered valuable loot, animals and slaves for themselves before withdrawing to the mainland, their task complete to Caesar's satisfaction. Doubling back, Julian attempted to prepare the strategic fortress of Tres Taberne for a siege by securing its fortifications and bringing in supplies. But this effort too was hindered by Barbatio, who again burned the much needed supplies, with Ammianus Marcellinus speculating that he was either an empty-headed fool or doing so at the behest of a supremely paranoid Constantius who wanted Julian to fail or be killed. As though to prove karma a very real thing, as Barbatio's 25,000 strong army were in the vicinity of modern-day Strasbourg, then known as Agenteratum, they were surprised and set upon by a massive horde of Alemanni warriors. Rather than fighting with his formidable force, Barbatio abandoned his wing of the pincer maneuver and withdrew all the way back to Augusta Rorica. During the retreat, a deserter from Barbatio's army went over to the Germans and informed them that Julian's remaining forces were small in comparison and could be easily destroyed. Emboldened by this news and concerned at Julian's fortification at Savene, Chinodoma managed to rally a number of other Germanic kings to his side, combining their forces together near Agenteratum, only a relatively short distance from Tres Tabene. Inspired by the words and deeds of Roman leaders reaching back to the founding, Julian marched along the military road throughout the morning of August 24, 357, nearing Chnodomar's force of Alemanni and friends at around midday. Hunger for glory wasn't about to dampen the Caesar's wisdom, and he ordered his troops to encamp, rest, refresh and regroup for battle the next day. The soldiers, however, weren't happy with that. By striking their spears and shields together, they made clear to Julian that they wanted to fight the barbarian invaders now, while they were still one for- oh, Don't know why it's there. Uh, one. Convinced or coerced, Julian right. decided to fight. <laughs> the Roman force, arraying opposite Chnodomar's horde, had Tres Tabene to its rear and could therefore retreat to a ready citadel if necessary. But the Alemanni only had the Rhine at their back. But this strategic disadvantage was offset by numerical disparity. Julian only had 13,000, while the Germanic coalition, however sketchy estimating their numbers can often be, probably brought to bear about 34,000. The bulk of the Alemanni infantry was deployed in the center of the battlefield. Each warband and chieftain's contingent under the command of whichever warlord or tribal leader they were bound to. Schnodemar's right flank was anchored by an area of forest, inside which the Germanic king placed a force of ambushing infantry under his nephew Serepio. On the other side of the field was Schnodemar himself, at the head of 4,000 barbarian cavalry intermixed with light infantry. A deep formation comprising three of Julian's thousand-strong post-Constantinian legions were deployed front and center, flanked by close-ordered Auxilia Palatina units, Conuti Brachiati, Petulantes and Heruli, each of which were about 500 men strong. Severus was on the left with yet more legions, and in reserve was Julian himself, accompanied by several hundred Scolarii guards and an elite honored legio known as the Primani. On flat ground to Julian's right were the 3,000 crack Roman cavalry, deployed with lighter skirmishers in front and the Caesar's ultimate weapon behind, a division of lethal, fully armored cataphractarii shock riders. Before the two sides clashed, enraged cries erupted from the Alemanni line of battle. To the Romans this may have sounded like a hostile war chant, but it was in fact a typically Germanic method of shaming their leaders into dismounting 
and preventing them from abandoning the regular warriors to their fate if battle went badly. Under pressure from their own soldiers, Schnodemar and the other leaders leapt from their horses and commanded on foot. To the hail of blaring trumpets, both sides advanced towards one another, the Caesar's Roman army in an inexorable, lava-like crawl, and their Alemanni enemies in a swift charge which cared little for maintaining tight order. Closing fast, the Germanic tribesmen sounded their fearsome howls of war and snarled at the Romans in a manner which had, in ages past, caused a rout through sheer intimidation. However, the grizzled, barbarian-infused imperial military of late antiquity was far more resistant to such scare tactics and continued unfazed. Schnodemar's impetus-driven warriors lobbed their javelins first, loosing a deadly rain of sharp iron straight for the Roman front line. With customary iron discipline, the legionary infantry raised their shields to block the incoming missiles and continued advancing. Once the barrage was over, the Romans launched their own wave of projectiles before getting locked in a vicious melee with the barbarian invaders. Julian's first crisis point showed itself on the left. During the forward movement, Severus's left had come within dangerous proximity of the forest inside which lay Nodomar's ambush. Unfortunately for the Alemanni king, some of Serapio's warriors had leapt up from their hiding places preemptively, alerting Severus to their presence and allowing the Roman general to call an urgent halt before the situation became truly critical. Still, the Caesar's left flank was descended upon by an ambushing force which far outnumbered it, getting into difficulties under pressure from both the front and left. In the rear of the battlefield, Julian observantly caught on that Severus was in big trouble and rode to his sub-commander's aid with the Scolaris cavalry. As he made his way, Julian continuously exhorted the units that he passed to greater courage, inspiring them with his oration. By the time the Caesar reached Severus's section, the notoriously ferocious charge of Serapio's soldiers was over, and the situational advantage shifted to the Romans. Julian kept himself behind the line, rather than fighting at the forefront, ordering the left to fight in a looser formation so that encirclement would not become a threat, and even managed to pull back an overzealous unit at risk of pushing too far. After a shaky start, Severus and Julian managed to repel and push back the Alemanni opposing them, stabilizing that part of the field. However, the Caesar had a far more serious problem to deal with. Over on the flat side of the battlefield, Roman cataphractari and their skirmisher vanguard charged straight at Chnodoma. While the initial impact was devastating, the Alemannic king's intermingling of infantry within his cavalry had a terrible effect. Nimble barbarian infantry armed with spears slipped between the cumbrous imperial horsemen thrusting up at them from below and dismounting or killing them outright. Many casualties were inflicted in this way, until finally the cataphractari commander was thrown from his horse, leading to the entire cavalry flank turning and running. Schnodemar's intelligent counter to Julian's mounted superweapon appeared to have been a flying success. The retreating cavalry veered dangerously towards Julian's infantry regiments in search of protection, threatening their formation's integrity and potentially cracking the entire front line in the process. However, the resolutely disciplined Conuti and Bracciati units stood their ground with admirable sturdiness, closing ranks and forming a barrier against their own retreating cavalry, stabilizing the line just in time and diverting the routing riders away. According to Ammianus Marcellinus, who may have been a participant in this battle, Julian looked across the battlefield and saw his cavalry retreating in shame. Taking his iconic purple dragon banner, the Purpureum Signum Draconis, in hand, the Caesar rode across the entire width of the field with his Scolarii and placed himself between the Cataphractarii and escape. Upon recognizing the imperial banner of their commander, the cavalry stopped their retreat. In one of the truly brilliant and possibly apocryphal mid-battle speeches of ancient history, Julian is recorded to have asked his faltering warriors, Whither we are fleeing, my most valiant men? Do you not know that flight never leads to safety, but shows the folly of a useless effort? Let us return to our companions, to be at least sharers in their coming glory, 
if it is without consideration that we are abandoning them as they fight for their country. Julian's magisterial charisma induced the disgraced Cataphractarii into turning their mounts around and returning to battle. But it was too little too late. The same Auxilia Palatina units that stood like a rock in the face of routing riders now came under similarly vicious attack from Chnodomar's infantry. Even when faced with this pressure, the Palatina did not break, keeping the barbarians at bay until a Batavi Palatina regiment from the second line arrived and stabilized the line. Fortunately for them, the triumphant Germanic cavalry was nowhere to be seen. Rather than crashing on and falling on the remaining units opposing them post-victory, Schnodemar's mounted division regrouped into a great strike force and wheeled around, traversing the entire length of the battlefield, with the likely aim of joining Serapio and exploiting a weakness on the Roman left. Despite being in balance, the battle near Ogentaratum was turning into a close-run thing, and a breakthrough anywhere could signal the bloody end for either side. While the fighting was ongoing, a number of Alemanni nobles and their respective elite warrior cadres massed behind the barbarian center. Once the fighters were ready and fired up, a battering ram of Chnodomar's very best troops barreled forwards, crashing straight into the Roman center. Shortly after, they managed to tear a hole straight through it. Julian's entire first line recoiled at the shock impact and bent into the shape of a bow snapped in the center. Hundreds of Alemanni elites streamed through the gaping wound in the Roman battle line, threatening to roll up the entire formation and win Chnodomar his long-awaited victory against the Empire. To maintain composure in such a potentially life-threatening situation is a testament to the hardened Roman infantry and their trust in the Caesar by whom they were led. Julian was to prove that their trust was well placed. Immediately after the Alemanni's ramhead shattered Julian's first line, the Caesar ordered his honored primary legion to meet the threat. They did just that, meeting the Germanic charge with their shields like a wall of steel, stopped it in its tracks and shoved it back, butchering many of the interlopers in the process. Meanwhile, Severus pushed through the forest and disordered Serapio's wing before it had a chance to unite with the cavalry. This provoked a general Alemanni retreat in that area of the battlefield and allowed Severus to swing inwards, carving through the enemy flank. Julian's standout Auxilia Palatina units managed to push the Alemanni back as well, and this triggered a general barbarian flight. Many were slain during the battle itself, but many times more were cut down as they fled towards the Rhine, speared in- That's honestly insane though that they, <laughs> that like they were like down like twice the size of the barbarians. That's actually pretty insane. In the back by onrushing Roman cavalry, or ruthlessly cut down by the swing of a legionary sword. Once the exhausted survivors reached the river, many attempted to swim across its breadth in their panic, only to ignominiously drown or provide an easy target for Roman javaneers and archers. A significant number of Germans managed to withdraw across the Rhine, but the prime barbarian Chnodomar was not among them. After attempting to escape numerous times, and fighting a last stand with 200 of his personal retinue atop a small hill, the Alemanni warlord surrendered to a lone legionary officer who took him to Julian in chains. Following his reception of the king's acquiescence to Roman demands, the Caesar sent Chnodomar off to Constantius's court. He eventually died of old age in Rome, far from his native land. For what his figures are worth, Ammianus Marcellinus tallies up the Roman dead at just 243 soldiers and four officers, two of which were Cataphractarii commanders, a third who served as a tribune of the exemplary Conuti Auxilia regiment, and a fourth tribune who goes unnamed. Compared to this slight loss, Julian's surveyors recorded 6,000 dead Alemanni on the battlefield alone, not accounting for the later deaths by drowning. At Agenteratum, the young bookworm Julian won the final true victory that the Roman Empire would ever achieve before its western half collapsed. His decapitation of the Alemanni Confederation meant that rather than facing a unified barbarian threat, the imperial forces could pick off individual tribes one by one. It was such a victory that Julian's over-eager men acclaimed him Augustus, 
but the Caesar repudiated his soldiers and calmed their enthusiasm, all too aware that the affront would trigger the paranoia of his murderous relative. In the second episode of our miniseries, we will talk about Julian's rise to power, as well as his struggle against Christianity and his war against the Sassanids, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and- Well, this was a really good video. Um, yeah. So, all right, that is it. That is the, the rise of the last uh, pagan emperor of Rome, uh, Julian. And I uh, guess, you know, if you want to, we'll go and see the second up, the second part of this. So, yeah, talk to you guys in the next video. Also, subscribe to the channel. I want to get down subscribers by uh, my birthday, September 13th. And also, comment videos that you want me to react to in the comment section down below. And, uh, yeah, um, talk to you guys in the next video. Peace.